Good evening, and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor A.D., Pastor of True Vine, NBC here in Houston, Texas, and I thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. And before I get started, please, if you haven't subscribed to this channel and looking down in our description for all our information, if you want to become a member of this church, all you, have to, all you have to do is send an email and we will get back with you. But God bless you and we thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. And today's topic is the vital call to lead the church, the vital call to lead the church. Talk about leadership and overseer. So this is like part three. And we're in verse three of 1 Timothy chapter three, verse three of 1 Timothy chapter three. And of course I have an overview, but first I'm gonna pray and we'll get started. Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, for being who you are, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross and rising on the third day with our power for our sins, Lord. And you have given us eternal life. We love you so much, Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you would please, dear God, direct this in your word, Lord. And Holy Spirit, continue to speak to our hearts. Continue, help us do better every single day, Holy Spirit. We love you so much. In Jesus' holy name we pray, pray amen, amen, amen. Amen. So again, the topic is the vital call to lead the church, talking about leadership and overseer. So here's the overview. Now, before we get into this list again, and we're taking our time because there's so much that we need to talk about. We might just answer the general question when a person is called to lead the church in general. What are they really called to do? I don't necessarily mean just in specific their teaching and leading and praying and those kinds of things or dating other elders. But within that leading and teaching the praying, what are their objectives? What are the goals? What are the what are they trying to accomplish? What is the church leader to be all about? Now, let me answer that. But by just giving you a brief list of things that the church leader must focus his life on. And these are the priority things. We could spend a lot of time talking about the things we don't need to be doing, but if we talk about what we don't need to do and we'll be doing, right, it, it will adequately fill up our whole life and the other discussion will be rather a uh, mod discussion. And so what is it that one call to pastor a church, to lead a church as an elder or overseer is really called to do? What are you really called to do as a overseer. First of all, those called into the church leadership are called to work for the salvation of the unconverted, to save souls, to work for the salvation of the unconverted. That's obvious. Whatever else we do in the church, the ultimate primary task, the objective is to bring about salvation to the lost sheep, right? To the lost souls. So all of the means of the church and all the disciplines of the church and all the duties of the church and all the functions and the programs and ministries of the church have as their ultimate in salvation of the unconverted. Bring into Christ those that do not know him. We are called, as was Paul, to open their eyes, to convince them, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified, just like we once received the word of God because we were once lost in the world. And we are called to bring about the salvation of the unconverted. We are to cry after the un unpenitent and unbelieving and to apply <clears throat> great work of converting souls, whatever else we may have to leave undone this is essential this is why we're here church to see people who do not know christ come to know him so mark it when you are called to church leadership you are called to task of bringing the unconverted sinners to christ secondly number two it is a supporting priority for the church leader to build up the save to maturity in christ to mature the church to grow the church to make sure they are not on milk anymore, but to get them on meat, warning them that a they are unruly and, un, and encouraging the faint-hearted and, and um, supporting the weak and being patient to all men. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 14, we are called to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry to the building 
to the building of the body of Christ. So the priority then of perfecting and polishing the saints for useful service, for strong service for Christ is a top priority. This means we must provide care for those who fall into sin. For those must provide care for those who fall into sin, for those who lose their zeal, for those who disobey the word, for those who lose their first love. The responsibility of strengthening, restoring those who are overtaken in a sin, feeding, challenging, the strong to greater perseverance and even greater strength. The third thing we could spend a lot of time on each, but just to touch them, the third thing that we are called to do by way of objective in the ministry is to feed the flock the word of God regularly. To feed the flock the word of God regularly, continuously. Um, a strong and steady diet of divine truth and exhortation is the core of church life. There should be in the heart of pastor or elder a certain amount of anxiety, a certain amount of pain. Paul calls it um, travel, trivial um, uh, birth pains, okay, until the people have Christ formed in them. This means that we are involved also in the ministry of intercession on behalf of those to whom we speak the, the word of God. Another of our priorities is to give special attention to the special the spiritual order and devotion of families to give uh, special attention to the spiritual order and devotion of families. This involves leading families, I think, into proper roles, men into proper roles for men, women in proper roles for women. This involves teaching families how to love each other, how to serve each other, how to combat treacherous, destructive things that are happening in the world around them, influencing that tend to hear uh, to tear the family apart, okay? So that's what he's called to do. This involves teaching the family how to devote themselves to one another, how to devote themselves to God, how to devote themselves to the word, how to devote themselves to the church, how to devote themselves to the ministry, and how to have a Christ at the center of everything they do. It is a high priority of ministry in the church to give special attention to the spiritual order and devotion of families. Another one that helps crystallize what it is, is that the pastor or elders does, we are to minister to those people who are in special distress. We are to minister to those people who are in special distress. One of the great tribulations in ministry and it is all to, it's as it ought to be as the Savior gives us the example is to reach out to those people who have unusual problems, whether they are ill, whether they are facing death, whether they are have disease or, or divorce or disappointment, whether they've gone through a disaster, whether they are in need of comfort. We should be there. This becomes a very important matter of commitment on the part of those who serve in the church to minister to the people who are in special distress. Another one in terms of objectives or goals is to administer the Lord's ordinance of baptism and communion. I believe those who are called to leadership in the church have the responsibility to keep the people alert to the death of Christ and alert to the resurrection, to keep the death and resurrection of Christ in forefront of the thinking of the people. And that is done by the patterns of the Lord's table and baptism. The Lord's table reminds us of his death. Baptism reminds us of his resurrection. We consistently, constantly involve ourselves in, in those ordinances in order that we might demonstrate to the people as re reminders that Jesus died and rose again for them. Another element of objective and purpose in the ministry is to lead the church together in holiness, in Christ's likeness, so as to be salt and light in the world. To lead the church together in holiness and Christ's likeness so that we can be salt and light in the world. The church is to shine as the light in in a dark place. It is to penetrate this evil generation that is essential to the life of the church and therefore must be a priority that is established in the hearts of those who lead the church. Now, you can see then by just this little list of things that we are called to that we have a very, very serious responsibility as overseers. 
working for the salvation of the unconverted, building up the saved to maturity in Christ, feeding the flock the word of God regularly. Not only that, but we are called also to give special attention to the spiritual order and devotion of families, to minister to those in special times and distress, to administer baptism and communion, to lead the church to holiness and Christ likeness so it can be the salt and light in the world and penetrate the darkness with the saving truth of Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. So having said all that, we recognize then that this is a high and holy and sacred calling to which men are called when they are called into leadership of the church. It involves several things. It involves discipline. Among anyone who is going to be successful in fulfilling this divine calling is going to maintain in his own life discipline. You're giving yourself to this tremendous, immense task, taking the unsaved out of the hand of Satan from the clutches of the death and hell is not an easy task. And even instructing the saints to maturity is not easy task. And the work demands diligent effort. It demands hard, hard, hard toil because rescuing man from hell is no easy job. It also demands not only the discipline and self-denial and the hard work, but it also demands great care, planning and order and the ability to do what is priority, the ability to structure your life to the things that matter. It also involves doing all of this with gentleness and all of this with humility while maintaining passion and severity and zeal and seriousness. It, it is a matter of being confrontive and dramatic and direct and authoritative and yet being warned and loving and affirming and compassionate. The various things that come together to suit a man for this are quite humanly impossible. And over all of this must come a great amount of patience, 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 <laughs> patience. God is working <laughs> with me on in that area. A great amount of patience. Thirdly, number three, he is sober minded. That means well disciplined in his mind. His mind is ordered. He has a sure, steady, thoughtful, earnest, and well disciplined, well ordered mind. He has control of his pleasures. He has he had control of his passions. He had, his mind is an ordered mind. As a result of that, we remember of good behavior. We come, which comes next. The fourth of qualifications is moral life. That is well ordered life. Well ordered life. A well ordered mind produces a well ordered life. A chaotic mind produces a chaotic chaotic life. So you have an ordered life flowing from in ordered mind because everything in his mind has its priority ranking because everything in his mind has its time and place everything in his life does as well because a man thinks in his heart so is he so as a man thinks in, in his heart so is he filthy filth i'm sorry filthy filthy he is characterized by being given to hospitality which means he loves strangers he, he has the ability to love strangers he is not at all a respecter of persons he does not hold one race as superior to another he is able to love strangers he goes beyond the circle of his own friends and his own life is open he opens his life to others he's not a closed person he's not a reclose he's not private he's public in the sense that he opens his life and heart and arms and his home and his world to people in need whether he knows them or whether he does not know them he demonstrates the love of christ the compassion of god toward those who are in distress and those who have need sixthly it says at the end of verse two he is apt to teach he is apt to teach he is skilled in teaching he is skilled in teaching now this is the only one of the qualifications that has anything to do with what he does functionally so all the rest are strictly characteristics of his life this does relate to his function but is nonetheless a moral qualification for the essence of all teaching is an example and it is what he is that is priority in his ability to communicate to others so the heart of the task of teaching is his character now when you look at the concept of skilled in teaching you say well if a man's going to go into church as an elder or a leader in a church or overseer or a pastor of a church 
he, you young men that are looking for that, you folks that are trying to evaluate perhaps your own children and whatever you may be looking at, what you what what are the criteria to identify a person as a skilled teacher? So the skilled teacher has an exemplary life. He lives it. He doesn't only talk it. He lives it. The gift of teaching, doctrinal um, reservoir, humility, holiness. He's diligent in his biblical study. He avoids error. He finally and finally, as a result of those things, he has strong courage and consistent conviction. The skill teaches with conviction the skilled teacher teaches with conviction so let's look at verse three let's look at verse three not given too much wine not violent not greedy for money but gentle not quarrelsome not covetous so let's look at that it says in the authorized not given too much wine the word is paranoos paranoos and it basically means a drinker not a drinker not a drinker. It isn't a reference to someone who drinks unto drunkenness. That's obvious, right? It wouldn't have to include drunkenness here. Anyone would know that a drunk was not fit to leave the church, right? That's a given. That should be common sense, right? Whether he think he drinks to the drunkenness or not isn't the issue, okay? The issue is whether he has a reputation as a drinker. That every almost every time you see this person, he's drinking and drinking liquor put it like that and you can go back to the word temperate and we saw there the idea of wineless but here is another idea another idea there it has to do with his watchfulness and his clear headedness and his alertness here it has the idea of association he is not a drinker he does not fre frequent he doesn't frequent bars and taverns and inns. He doesn't do that. He doesn't visit them like that frequently. He doesn't sit around in all the noisy scenes and associated with drinking and make those his habit or his habitat. He doesn't find his place in the tavern, in the salon, and in the bar, in the saloon, I'm sorry, in the saloon, in the bars and doing things like that and in the clubs. He doesn't do that. No, that's the issue here. He is not a drinker. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 22 tells us to avoid all appearance of evil. Avoid all appearance of evil. It means all outward display of evil. We are certainly not to occupy ourselves with that. In chapter 3, the same chapter, verse 8, it gives the same qualifications for a deacon, basically. He's not to be a drinker either. There is no place for that in leadership. That's why in Proverbs 31, it says wine is not for kings and princes. And that's why Leviticus 10 and 9, it says it's not for priests. Anybody in spiritual leadership stays away from anything that blurs their vision. In Isaiah 56 and 9, listen to what it says. All you beasts of the field come to devour. All you beasts in the forest. Why? Here it is. His watchmen. That's the leaders of Israel are blind. They are ignorant. They are dumb dogs. They can't bark. In other words, they don't even warn, you know, like the watchdog who doesn't bark when the robber comes, sleeping, lying down, loving in slumber. Um, they, they are greedy dogs and they can never have enough. And they are shepherds. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They are they, they all look to their own way. Everyone has his gain for his own gain and for his quarter, for his money, for his dollar. This is what they say. Come, I'll fetch the wine and, and we'll fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow we'll be as this day and much more abundant. We'll just keep drinking day after day. That's the spiritual leadership of Israel. It, is, is it any wonder that they went into the depths that they did bondage after bondage after bondage? right because of the disobedience because of their drinking and would you please notice again now verse 3 says he's not violent he's not violent so not of too much drink and not violence you know because drinking can lead to what violence i think this is wonderful you're not to be a pastor if if the way you handle things is with your fist or with instruments of violence that seems kind of obvious doesn't it it literally means not a giver of blows, um, plectis, plectis, plectis in Greek. So not a giver of blows. 
He doesn't punch people when he gets upset. By the way, this is connected to the guy who is a what? Drinker. Usually, people who drink, the result of it often leads to violence. The idea here is a person who's not quick-tempered, one who doesn't resort to physical violence. I remember, and you can see that. You see that within the church. Um, if you've been in different churches, you see how things lead to violence within the church. Drinking leads to a lot of things. And so that's why it's good not to get drunk and not to be drinking. Really, if you have a part, a great role of leadership playing a part in the church, very important, very important. So remember what I said that Paul said to Timothy in chapter two of second Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not fight, but must not. And he must what? Strive. He must strive. He must not fight. He must strive. He doesn't deal with things like that. He doesn't resort to violence. And it's not only physical violence. I think we could imply also that it's verbal violence, cutting somebody out. His tongue is not to be a lashing tongue with reaching out in strife. First Timothy 6 talks about using the tongue to bring about strife and railings. Um, the tongue can be an instrument of violence. It can be, as James said in James 3, and we'll get to, into that. And so it, it can be set on fire all, all nature. It can set the whole nature on fire. Put it like that. The tongue can be a such a such violence and violent instrument. So the man then who leads the church is not to deal with difficulty through violent, physical, or verbal means. Notice then, and we skipped one in authorized version. It is not it is, it's not in the better manuscripts. It's covered by the last one. So we go to the one that says patient. Patient. Patient is epikias. Epikias. Epikias in Greek. It means to be considerate, um, forbearing, gracious, gentle. Aristotle said it has the idea of a person who easily pardons human failure. It's a beautiful virtue, a person who easily pardons human failure. And it's used in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. He says, the servant of the Lord, second, same chapter, verse 24, rather, says, don't start fights. Be gentle and patient. Patient. What does it mean? You remember, good, not evil. Good, not evil. You don't build up a chronicle, uh, some type of thing of everything, everything everybody and, and, and you and you go against everybody. Everybody will go against you. You want to beat them up and fight them. Listen, that is messed up. That has messed up a lot of people's ministry. Um, on and on, drinking, fighting, cussing them. I mean, on and on, things like that. It leads to a lot of other things, and it destroys your ministry. And so that's what happened in ministry. So there's something wonderful about having... Um, um, having great godly virtues and morals and, and really taking that into perspective and really housing that in yourself. And then not a brawler. Now that's amicos. Amicos. Amicos in Greek. Not a brawler. Again, this is a quarrelsome thing. It's very much like the other term we looked at, which talks about coming to blows, but it doesn't so much mean using physical violence. It means a quarrelsome person, just being a quarrelsome person, always wrapped up in mess. Nothing is more difficult in plurality of leadership. Leading a church than to have someone who just likes to quarrel about everything. And that's again, 2 Timothy 2, where he reminded Timothy not to be one who strives and argues, but to be gentle and patient and peacemaking. And then finally in verse 3, not covetous, not covetous. And that's that's aphologoros, aphologoros, that part two word, two part, three part word, really, with an alpha um, privative, privative uh, makes it a negative. But the two main parts mean to love silver, not to be a lover of silver. What a corruption that is in the ministry to love money, covetous, love money. So, it's a lot of those today, past pastors, that love money. And that's all they want is money. And all they do, all they preach for, the reason why they're preaching is for money, self-gain. 
love money and you see people as means to getting money. Everybody you look at becomes simply an, uh, an avenue for you to get rich. That is such a temptation. And that's why in 1 Timothy 6, Paul says in verse 6 to Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It's certain we're going to do what? Take nothing out of it when we leave, when we die. That's why I'm always so happy when they get that, uh, when they get the cast and funerals and everybody leaves the room and the guy starts talking, taking off all the jewelry and I don't see why because all that stuff you cannot take with you, you cannot take with you. It, it's no point. You can't take nothing, nothing with you. So it's no point of self gain of gain, trying to gain and, and use people and destroy people and to um, turn people away from Christ because of your greediness. And if you have food and, and raiment, uh, be content. But the people who pursue riches fall into temptation and snares, foolish, heartful lust that drown them in destruction and perdition. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people have coveted after money. Some people have coveted after money. They have eared from the faith. They have pierced themselves with many sorrows. And so it's very simple for me in the ministry to just draw the line at the bottom and say, I don't seek anything. Whatever the Lord provides, I thank him and praise him. And he's been very generous, free from love, the love of money. And this is the kind of person morally who's qualified to serve in leadership of the church of Jesus Christ. He doesn't have any earthly bound desires. See, he, he earthly bound desires and covetous spirit clip the wings of faith clip the wings of love, clip the wings of power. Believe me, he's not greedy. He's not stingy. He's not indulgent. He's not ambitious. That's the sum of verse two and three. The moral character of the man who leads the church. And my prayer is that God would give us such men today, that God will make us such men today because we're not all we ought to be. And we thank God that in his grace, he's allowed us to lead the church who are still pursuing the fulfillment of all those things. You pray for us, for the church around the world. And let me close by saying this. I believe it is becoming increasingly more difficult in our culture today to find people like this because our culture is so insidiously corrupted to find men who are qualified, so qualified, becomes more and more difficult. What a challenge what a challenge it is and um and we must pray for those we must continue to pray for those who are falling into temptation falling the leaders who are fall who have failed and are falling and who are going to fall into temptation you know so we must pray for each other keep each other lifted and edified in the spirit however when they do fall in that type of spiritual sin and physical sin they are not to be put back into that platform, that same platform. That's the Bible. We talked about that last time on last week. If you want to watch that video, go back on last week's um, Bible study video and watch that video. Watch the whole video. And I talked about that. And Paul talks about that. And he really illustrated that. And he pushed that. And he wanted, and he really wants us to receive that word, to receive that word and really um uh, let that penetrate through the church, within the church, and all around the church. Okay? Very important. Your leader is very important. Who he is, how he is, and what he is doing. And is he really living for Christ? That's the question. Are you really living for Christ? Of course, none of us are perfect. But we're supposed to be trying, doing our best every single day, growing, maturing every single day, evolving every single day growing to be more like Christ. Paul said, follow me while I follow Christ. Thank you so much for joining us. I love you so much. Tune in Friday. Tune in Friday to be encouraged by the word of God. It's a pastoral moment. I get to enlighten you and encourage you with the word of God. And tune in Sunday. All the children, tune in Sunday. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. We're going to have a ball the whole month of September with the children. This is going to be the children's month this year, sitting in September. And we're going to have a ball at True Vine. Ignite. Get ready. The fuse. Get ready. We are ready to ignite. The children are ready to ignite. They're so excited to be, uh, to be coming to church on Sundays 
in September. We are ready and we are fired up. God bless you. May you have a blessed rest of your week. And I'm telling you, keep God first and everything will fall behind that. God bless you until next time. We are True Vine. We're praying for you. Want to know why? Because we're True Vine and we are the church of love. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and join our online Christian family. Tithes, offerings, and donations can be made via Cash App at dollar sign TVMBC or by mail at True Vine Missionary Baptist Church, 1407 Grove Street, Houston, Texas, 77020. Thank you so much and have a blessed day.